the most iconic and photo of Dedan Kimathi is this. Him lying on a makeshift wooden stretcher after he was shot and captured. The home guards working for the colonial government netted a high-priced wanted man who was loved and considered messiah by his people, but a terrorist by the colonialists. It had taken them five years of combing the forest. If one finds themselves in this state, fear is a normal reaction. But there was no fear in Kimadi's eyes. His body language sent out a clear message. I think to understand his body language in that video, um, it helps to understand the context of the man and the context of the occasion, what, um, you know, what was happening at this point in time, which was his capture. But let's first look at the man before. So those people that um, knew Dedan Kimathi knew one thing about him. He was a free spirit. There was nothing uncaged about him. Kimathi knew that his end had come. He did not get into the struggle to come out alive. To give his life was a price he had prepared himself to pay. When you look at it, you can see the rebellion in his eyes, the, the I regret nothing in his eyes. Um, and in fact, if you look at it keenly, um, you know, if, if you just you zoom out on what was happening around him, you will see that the, 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 the I would say, fear and discomfort is with those around him and not him. At that point in time, he looked fearless. And I've seen, um, you know, commentaries that said that they, they, they portrayed him as one who was helpless. Now, if you think about it based on what um, media propaganda was meant to do, remember the British were, expert at the, were experts at it, at it, using the media um, you know, for propaganda. But also remember the world at that time, 56, 57, was coming from a place fresh out of the Second World War where media had been perfected as a tool of propaganda. So that is what they were actually trying to do. They were actually trying to portray him as weak and defeated. But when you look at it, his face doesn't betray any weakness. Was the case by the colonialist against Kimadi a fair one? Why is written material about him unavailable in the country he fought for? Did Kimadi inspire other resistances against colonialism on the African continent? What happened to the natives who helped the colonialists arrest Kimadi? Well, this is that story. I am Agutu Rosa. On 21st October 1956, Diragumau, whose nickname was Gedeme, shot Kimadi. Dirago senior on the left side was a home guard employed on a salary of 60 shillings a month. He had been selected as part of the team sent out to capture Kimadi. He did not know how Kimadi looked like, but he knew he had to be captured because the reward was enticing. A former editor at the Standard newspaper, Mashua Koinange, recalls his encounter with Dirango in 1985. Speaking with KTN News via his cell phone, Mashua says that when he met Dirago, he was a remorseful elderly man who regretted shooting Kimadi. The only thing he had to show for the betrayal against his people was a truck stuck in his compound that was never used. In an article he wrote for The Standard back then, Mashua said that Dirango was reluctant to do the interview, but when he accepted, it was his chance to seek closure. Dirango told Mashua that after days of searching in the forest, one morning at around 6.30 a.m., they saw a glimpse of something. It was a man attempting to cross a ditch carrying a bundle. We shouted at him to stop, but he started running. I fired and missed. I ran after him alone and fired again, but missed as he disappeared into the woods. He followed hot on his heels and caught sight of him as he tried to jump over a ditch. He fired. This time, he got him. I had shot him on his right thigh. He was wearing a leopard skin. His bundle of sugarcane was lying next to him. He was holding a panga in one hand. He studied the man, perplexed. Finally, he asked in Gikuyu, Who are you? Field Marshal Dedan Kimadi was shuri. He answered. Kimadi asked him, Are you the one who shot me? Dirago said, Yes. Newega. It's okay, Kimadi replied, resigned to his fate and in pain. Dirago was awarded £150, 
that is around 23,000 Kenya shillings today. Another officer, Njugin Gatia, who assisted him in operation, was awarded £75, which is around 11,500 shillings today. The total reward was £500. The remaining sum was divided among the team that was involved in the capture. Dirango used the money to buy a public transport minibus. Nobody ever boarded it. Only his family. At night, angry residents would scratch the vehicle using stones, writing the words Muridhimo wa Kimadhi, meaning Kimadhi's shin, which referred to the part of the body that was short. He tried selling it, but nobody was willing to buy Kimadhi's shin. The vehicle ended up rusting in his compound. Dirango later opened a restaurant and it met the same fate. Residents would write on the walls, Mudherimo wa Kimadhi. Dirango lived a shameful life. He was treated as an outcast. And the treatment also befell his children who found it hard to cope in school. In 1986, Dirango died. His fellow home guards combined their rewards and bought a lorry. It met the same fate. Now, uh, the Kimadi's trial was not fair at all. It was more of a kangaroo court. Kangaroo in the sense, his was a political case. Remember, he was, a more, of, he was more of a politician, though Kimadi would not have accepted to be called a politician. Would have, although he was KAU branch, Chairman by 1950s, by 1952. 50, uh, so his trial was supposed to be a political trial, like that of Nelson Mandela, whereby you don't hang a political prisoner. You could put him in jail or detention and then release him after you achieve what you want. Yeah, yes, but you see, they criminalized it. The first judgment in the Kimadi case was done in haste, and when he appealed, it was quickly dismissed. An execution report that is kept at the Supreme Court Museum of Kenya indicates that Kimadi was hanged at 6 a.m. on February 18, 1957. The report signed by a medical officer indicates that he examined the body of the deceased and found life to be extinct. Death was caused by hanging and it was instantaneous. The judgment report that is also kept at the museum indicates that Kimadi was in possession of a firearm, A38 Webley Scott revolver, contrary to Regulation 8A1 of the Emergency Regulations 1953. However, when Dirango shot Kimadi, he said he found him with a panga and a bundle of sugarcane. There was no revolver. He was accused of uh, having a revolver. By that time, he only had a machete or panga. Hey, like somebody who wants sugar cane to, uh, to uh, sugar cane to, you know, to, and use the panga to, to, to get, you know, it done. And, uh, but there in the trial, they added things that were not there, the things that were rumored about him. Yes, again, uh, the, the, it was very unfair. They were even fearing a dead man. They buried him, um, understand, with, yes. They, 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 is with handcrafts. In her book, Kimadi's widow, the late Mukami, recalls that while in prison, warders would come and tell her about the progress of the trial. They would say that he will be convicted because everyone in the court, apart from Kimadi, was a colonialist or a colonialist sympathizer. A day before Kimadi was executed, Mukami was taken to see him. His hands were not cuffed and the colonialists had gone to great lengths to confirm that he was the one. One of his fingers on his left hand had been partly severed earlier while he grind grass for cattle. This happened while they lived in Olkalao. Many white people had checked his finger as proof that they had captured the right man. The British colonialists promised Kimadi life, wealth and acres of land if he disowned the Mau Mau. After all, that was what they were fighting for. Edaka Nawiyadi, land and freedom. But he had refused because he had taken an oath. He had two regrets, he said, that he would not live long enough to see his children grow and that he would not live to see a black man raise a Kenyan flag high. Kimadi requested his wife not to let the name Kimadi Washuri die. In case she remarried and had other children, Kimadi asked her to have the children use his name. Today, all the children she got after bear the name Kimadi. 
Mukami left her husband after being told that it would be good if the children saw their father for the last time. The following morning, Kimadi had been executed. It was emotional torture for her and her children, a psychological game the colonialists loved playing on their victims. Mukami's last born child, a chief executive officer of Dead and Kimadi Foundation, Evelyn Wanjogo, recalls her childhood as one that was influenced by parents who were traumatized by the past. So, Sisi, to Kikua, Kama Watoto, and Maumau, to the Kuta, Wazazi, and Bao, Wako, traumatized, Wana Fikria Kwani. Wazazi wetu waliishi kutuliza kwani tulikosea sisi kuingia mustuni kupigania inti yetu kwa sababu hakuna mtu anatushugulikia, hakuna mashamba. So mamangu alika ali, ali kitu ambia, tulipigana na kikombe, tulienda kucheza mpira lakini kikombe kikatukuliwa na wale ambao walikuwa wanatushangilia. Wana after independence, Mukami Kimadi approached Prime Minister Jomo Kenyatta and requested for the remains of her husband. Mara yake ya kwanza kuitisha mifupa ama remains ya baba yetu ilikuwa 1963. Venye tu mwazirishu wa inchi Jomo Kenyatta alipo apishwa akiwa Prime Minister. Mama adio mtu wa kwanza alikuwa wa kwanza kumuambia musaidie kupata the remains of our father. But to one reason or another, which we cannot bring to anyone, it never happened. It never happened in the, in the second regime, the third regime, it never happened. The fourth regime, it never happened. Kimadi was actually shortchanged by the Kenyan government. And that is very clear by the Jomo Kenyatta regime, by President Daniel Arap Moi regime. It wasn't fair because he was shortchanged because you can see he was shortchanged because um, it is Mandela who in 1990, all those years after the man was hanged or Kenya got independence in 1963, that he made us, he pricked our consciences as a country and asked us, where is this hero who inspired Omkonto Esiswe in South Africa, made us fight apartheid. He gave us a way that it reaches a time, a turning point in the life of any human being when you refuse to be called uh, a doormat. Kimadi can be said to be among those young people who stepped forward to respond to the call of uh, the mission to liberate Africa. And he's particularly special because uh, the movement he led has inspired a lot of changes within Africa. You will remember that uh, Dedan Kimadi inspired Mukondo Sizwe. Uh, Dedan Kimadi, when De Mandela came here, he said, the person who inspired my politics is, is Dedan. And um, the name has cut across the republic and across the world as well. The Umkoto Wesizwe is among the groups that were inspired by Kimadi. Umkoto Wesizwe is a paramilitary wing on the African National Congress led by Nelson Mandela that was fighting the then government. I think if we had to be fair, we would call him the first the Prime Minister of the Republic of Kenya and his wife, the first lady. He is um, the bearer of the vision that has eluded us all this time. I think that if Dead and Kimathi went to the Lancaster discussions, the issue of land would have been resolved differently because we would not have compromised, because the basis of the struggle was land. And for failing, for having been denied the opportunity to go and uh, participate in those discussions, we ended up having a new colony instead of a colony. So he's the best and remains the best leader we ever had. It is believed that the remains are at Kamiti Maximum Prison. That is where mass burials were done after the executions. I think the government knows where he was buried. Even you and I can guess it is in Kamiti. But uh, when I was talking to the retired mayor of Kirigoya Kutus before he died, Mayor Mwangi, uh, Mayor Mwangi told me he was also a prisoner in that committee, and they used to be woken up at the wee hours of the night to bury bodies of those who had been hanged. 
So the fear he had is in that committee area, um, they could have buried Kimadi together with other bodies to so as to conceal. That could complicate the matter. Because if Meamwangi's position uh, is correct, then uh, it will be a hard task to get him. But because he was hand, handcuffed, his hands were handcuffed. And I understand he was wearing the, the same, uh, there could be traces, there could be a way, even uh, DNA, there are quite a number of things. Field Marshal Mudoni Wakirema, who was part of Kimadi's foot soldiers, believes that for a person to be considered dead, his body must be produced. We met Mudoni at her home in Nyeri before she shaved her locks. At the time, she was 92 years old. She greeted us the African way, bits of spittle on our hands, a sign of blessings. He was a good leader who delegated duties and was fair. He gave us nicknames so that our identities would be safe. For example, I was called Nina Waldonjo, meaning mother of the bird. Is he the president we never had? That's a question. Now, let me tell you that uh, it, it is possible. It is rangely true. It could be the president. Kenya will never hand. And that's the most likely. Because Kenya does not need a politician. It needs a kemadi, a manager. A person who can manage with nothing. A very creative man. A creative man. You know, fighting a conventional army. And by 1994, all the forests in Mount Kenya region and left Valley, they were totally taken by the Mau Mau. And the same year, 1954, they had rid more or less Conga and taking taxes. The Mau Mau had won in 1954, before the British got, you know, those uh, bombarding jets, which were used to bring down out of Itra. When uh, they campaigned to show that really Mau Mau were a terrorist group, they need international concern. They are killing priests, they are killing the churchmen. You know, they're trying to cry to the world the government to, so that they are helped to crush them. Uh, in, on 5th February, 1954, Kimadi formed a parliament. Parliament. The first Kenyan parliament was constituted in the forest. And that almost made uh, some people feel uncomfortable because it was a complete parliament. Yes, and given all the duties a parliament would have. And they drew a better constitution maybe than the Lancaster House where they looked at the foreign policy, whom, who will be our friend when we get into power. They looked at the, the, the cash crop farming, the food crop farming, uh, the schools they need per district, per sub-district or division, per location. They looked at, uh, in their manifesto, they also looked at how laws can be fixed, okay? That will favor everybody in land ratio constitution, uh, inclusive constitution, akin to what we made in 2020. Far much better than what we got in 1963. So if you look at Kemadi reading the first Kenyan parliament constituted by African people in the forest in February 1952, I mean not 52, 1954, you can see that that is regularly the man we never gave the presidency. During the struggle, two sets of leaders emerged. Those that fought or participated in politics within the framework of the colonizer and the leaders who refused to join the politics drafted by the colonizers. Dedan Kimadi and Elijah Masinde were that kind. All those fellows who embodied revolutionary ideas. Now those ones were excluded. Those who were included in discussions were part sellouts, the graduates of the neocolonial education, led by Jaramogi, Shikuku, all those people. So those, they were basically picked because they represented a future that would be neocolonial. Political historians have claimed that the government that was set up in 1963 was designed to fail the family of Kimadi and push them into oblivion. In fact, it is uh, simply courtesy of... Uh, 
people's cries that you can see them occasionally mention names like David Kimathi. But otherwise, in their heads, that's a monster they need to exercise from their brains. So, Dead and Kimadi's family has been failed in every respect. It's not just a political recognition, it's also the personal level. Even in prison, there were radical fighters and conservative ones. We had uh, Karuki Jotara representing some degree of radical politics. We had um, Makan Singh, radical politics, people whose politics was best, was inspired by Mao Mao. And uh, when Kenya got independence, Moi did not, Kenya did not release them. They stayed for an additional one year <laughs> before they were released. So they come back when things are already in place. Due to his literary skills, Kimadi's responsibility was to maintain contact with the War Council in Nairobi on matters of new recruits, firearms, clothing and medical supplies. Because of that, he wrote about the progress of the struggle. In his book, Dedan Kimadi Speaks, historian and author Maina Wakinyati says that from the time Kimadi was made leader of KLFA, Kenya Land Freedom Army, he made it a habit of writing down his daily observations of the independence struggle in a personal diary. He also filed all the communications he received and copies of letters and documents he wrote. The documents were stored in an underground archive in Nyandarwa Forest in 1953 and appointed gorilla experts to man it, led by General Omera. Unfortunately, General Omera was captured in 1955 and after being tortured, he surrendered and led the British Army to where the documents were stored. The documents were in four sacks written in Gikuyu, Kiswahili and English and were translated and collated into four volumes of 30 pages each. They were then titled the Dedan Kimadi Papers. The documents were sent to the public office in London and a copy was sent to the Kenya Colonial Archives in Nairobi. According to Maina Wakinyati, none of these documents have been made public to date. Agutu Rosa, KTN News.